Awesome. So why don't we go ahead and get going this morning, or I should say afternoon, if everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Jeff Rhodes, a professor uh, of mechanical engineering, as well as currently the director of the Ray W. Herrick Laboratories. And I just want to thank you all for swinging by today. We're going to do this a bit informally today to try to get as many people to participate as we can. Uh, so the kind of formal plan for today is I'm just going to give about a 10 minute overview of the laboratories. Uh, and then I'm going to let Danielle speak for a couple of minutes. Danielle's a current PhD student in the labs. And then uh, both her and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the kind of Herrick experience, the research we do here. And I'm sure that uh, also would be happy to kind of answer questions you may have about Purdue, grad school, you name it, writ large. So, so maybe before we get going, just a little bit of background about me. I joined the faculty here about 14 years ago after graduating from Michigan State University. Uh, I have an interesting role now where I spend about 50% of my time doing research and running my research group and about 15% dealing with the administration of the laboratories. Um, and my role today is to not only introduce the laboratories to you, but really serve as a resource like I do to the students writ large at the laboratories to try to really set you up for success uh, as grad students if you decide to come join us and try to kind of experience uh, the Herrick way of life, for lack of a better term, which uh, we think is a, is a formula that works great for graduate education. So uh, this is a real informal setting. So if you have questions, please drop them in the chat as we go. And we'll leave plenty of time, you know, honestly, like 30 minutes or so for Q&A at the end. Let's go ahead and dig into it. So Herrick Labs has got kind of a long history uh, and it started uh, with animals. So uh, we are an interdisciplinary laboratory that was founded in the 1950s. And it was the first interdisciplinary laboratory uh, on Purdue's campus. And in fact, uh, if you can see my screen, you, the one on the upper left was a shot of the original laboratories building, uh, which we still use to this day. But it was a collaboration between animal science and mechanical engineering and was trying to look at what was the influence of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning on animals. And though we don't have animals anymore, other than humans, uh, you know, it's still very much kind of central to what we do. So. Uh, shortly after the 1950s, uh, Herrick continued to invest in faculty, graduate students, and equipment, uh, and really became the foremost HVACR research facility in the world. If you know anything about uh, air conditioners of the 1950s and 1960s, they were terribly noisy products. And so around the same time, motivated by the compressor problems that we were working on at that time, uh, we really launched a, a grouping uh, in uh, vibration acoustics uh, and noise control. And that has really become one of the other two pillars of strength for the laboratory in, in recent years. Uh, and really those two areas were, are what the laboratory is most known for. If, if you step forward into the 1980s, the laboratory started to do more work in renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart buildings, transportation, automotive engines, fence related research. And most recently, uh, things like smart materials, additive manufacturing, and perception-based engineering, which are kind of the intersections of psychology and mechanical engineering. And today, we are an interdisciplinary research lab that spans a number of, of majors and backgrounds, including mechanical, my home, civil engineering, architectural engineering, et cetera, and is really a unique place. And today, we maintain not only the barn, which has the cupola here in the bottom corner on the top, which is where some of our research activities are held, but we also have two additional research spaces, which you can see here in the lower right figure, which include our new facility, which was built in 2013, uh, where a lot of our current buildings research is conducted, as well as the building you see here in the background, which is the round show barn, which we use primarily for storage at this juncture. So we are a three building campus uh, that spans a, a number of uh, research groups. In terms of what we do, I highlighted a little bit of it on the previous uh, slide, but this is kind of a rundown. Uh, so we believe that we do really world-class research in a number of areas, and I kind of put a laundry list from our website here. And I somewhat intentionally snipped this picture from our website, because if you Google Herrick and Purdue, you'll find this, and you can click on each of these as a dropdown and see the faculty members that are involved in each of these areas, as well as some sample research that we do. But I think it's important to note that though we have really great traditional strengths in all of these areas, in the last few years, we've also made a considerable investment in our faculty, grad students, and facilities to facilitate research in the emerging areas of additive manufacturing, 
smart materials, engineering education, and engineering policy, as well as a recent thrust in kind of defense and energy related research. And these kind of portfolios, if you would, or areas of research really make up the complete portfolio of what we do now at the laboratories. And I would argue that most of these places are, are areas where we have unquestionable strength, typically not involving a single faculty member with a research group, but many faculty members and many research groups that engage collaboratively for kind of, uh, you know, to have worldly impact. If you will. Now, just to give you a sense of scope, I just want to include just a few facts and figures. So the laboratory currently consists of 32 faculty, about half of whom are full-time engaged at Herrick, half of whom are part-time engaged. And our student numbers are a little bit low right now because we haven't replenished uh, through graduation quite as quickly as we normally would with COVID. But you can see between undergraduate and graduate researchers, we have close to about 115 or so graduate students and undergrads in the building doing research on a daily basis. And this number is often uh, totals closer to 150, but uh, this is where we're at today, again, due to graduation. And I think it's important to note is that many of you on the phone are starting to look for research opportunities either at the undergraduate or graduate level that the vast majority of students working in our facilities are working on paid assistantships, whether that's a teaching assistantship, which make up about a quarter of these employees, or research assistantships, which make up about three quarters. Uh, the vast majority of our students are going to school for free, receiving stipends, partial health insurance, et cetera. And so we really pride ourselves on Herrick of trying to take care of our students well, you know, treating them like the degreed engineers they typically are or will soon to become in the case of our undergraduates. And I think that's really key to the type of environment that we have. Now, I always like to give a few random facts about Herrick and things that we do. So uh, these are a random snapshot I always like to take. So uh, one random thing that always is fun to know is that, you know, even though Herrick is known as a thermal sciences or a, a new acoustics and noise control, a transportation place, we really have had a lot of impact in materials in recent years. And I, I like to note that every Porsche Boxster and F-16 made uh, have materials that were originally designed here in Herrick in it. Uh, and so, you know, we, I bring this up because what you find is that one of the common threads between all the projects that we have in the laboratories is that they have practical real world impact. And almost everyone that graduates from the laboratory is undergraduate or graduate has a story about how their research has led to directly some impact in the world. Uh, and that's something that excites us. And in fact, is really what holds us together and leading into the second bullet point here uh, is that we have this strong desire to positively impact the world through real world engineering research and education. And that's really something that we, we strive for and take very seriously at the labs. And this kind of tie to the real world, I think is also what makes our alumni influencers and literally hundreds of global companies and government agencies. I'm sure Danielle can attest to this, but it's kind of rare uh, place in academia to be in a place like Herrick where it's not unusual to have the CEO or CTO of a, of a Fortune 500 camp company walking through the halls and, and to have a day later like a four-star general or a politician or something like that. And that seems to be kind of the norm, at least not when COVID's not around uh, at Herrick. And then certainly, you know, that tied to the real world, we believe comes from the fact that we tend to focus on kind of real world relevant problems, um, you know, not only tackling basic research challenges, but applied research challenges as well. Again, in this uh, litany of areas that I talked about on this slide here. Now, before I turn things over to Danielle to talk a little bit about the human experience, I just wanted to talk about uh, some of the things that go into each of these areas. Uh, that could be of interest to you and talk about some of the key faculty just really briefly. So, you know, the history of the labs is really related to HVACR systems, and that certainly remains a strength with people like Professor Grohl, Professor Braun, Professor Viviani, Professor Jane, and, and Professor Horton. And if you're interested in high performance buildings, thermal systems, uh, that's certainly an area of strength for us. Uh, Danielle can also talk about an emerging area of strength for us where people like Professor Moore. Uh, is looking at indoor air quality and, and the types of things that impact people in spaces. And uh, people like uh, Professor Peñota Carava and others uh, like Professor Bohr are really looking at the intersection between people and buildings or human systems and buildings. The noise control and vibration control area, we do a lot of work in materials, defense related problems, automotive related problems, consumer products, Sony laptops, HP printers, Dyson fans, you name it. Uh, this is really an area of strength for us. We have one of the largest dynamics and vibration groups in the world. 
Perception-based engineering is an interesting new thrust that combines people and psychology and products. This area is led up by Professor Patricia Davis, my predecessor as, as the director of the labs, uh, but is a really unique thing that understands the relationship between people and consumer products, people and transportation systems, people and buildings, uh, and is a really area of strength for us. And we have some very unique facilities to do that. Engines and exhaust system is a thrust area for people like Professor Greg Shaver and Professor Peter Meckel, uh, who work in a variety of advanced powertrains for companies like Caterpillar, Cummins, other folks like that around the world. And if you have an interest in control systems or exhaust systems, they would certainly be great to talk to. On the automotive and transportation sector, we have the two gentlemen mentioned previously, as well as folks like Professor Neera Jain, uh, who work at Machine Human Interfaces, and as well as people that work on platooning of vehicles for energy efficiency and things like that. So certainly a growing area for us and something that we believe strongly in, less probably on the automotive side and more on transportation in general and rethinking what is transportation at the end of the 21st century going to look like. That's certainly something that draws us. In terms of prognostics, diagnostics, and electromechanical systems, you can think of this as kind of applied uh, electronics, if you would. So we do a lot of work in control, robotics, actuators, sensor development, things like that. And that's really a thrust area for us. And then more recently, we've added additive manufacturing, which we've talked about a lot of work in smart materials with integrated sensors. And then three areas, uh, engineering collaboration, engineering education, engineering policy, which combines the traditional science disciplines of policy development and education uh, with the engineering disciplines we study. So this is really where our efforts are today and certainly areas where we're currently hiring graduate students. And if you have questions about any of those, we'd certainly be happy to answer them. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Danielle to talk a little bit about the student experience at Herrick and what it's like to be there. And I'm sure both of us would be happy to answer any questions that you have for us. So with that, I'll go ahead and let Danielle uh, share her Herrick experience. Um, so hi everyone. Um, I am a PhD student and I work at Herrick, like Dr. Rhodes was saying. Um, and my perspective may be a little different than other students. Um, actually, I did not know there were so many grad students. They fit in pretty well and so many undergrads. Um, but yeah, I'll be really excited to answer any questions that you have. And of all the people here, um, I hope that because you're in this talk, that means that you may potentially be at Purdue or at Herrick. And I think that's really exciting for you. So um, good job, at least looking into it or um, in your applications. Um, so I think this is something I've been thinking about a lot, but Herrick is a really unique space. And I think there's just so many reasons for that. Um, in my first year, I worked mostly in a different part of campus. So I can kind of like contrast my um, experience there and here. And um, I think one reason that it's such a unique community is that it's kind of its own space. And so it's a lot of different people working together um, so my background is in civil. There's a lot of mechanical engineers. There's some from electrical, um, maybe, I guess, environmental also in civil. So it's just like a mesh of different students working together. And there's not a lot of places like that on campus that are like that. So personally, a lot of my friends, I think more than half are actually from Herrick, um, which I think is really neat a lot of times. Uh, as a grad student, it can be hard to really find your social place because you get so caught up in research and classes um, that can be a little intense. So um, at Herrick, we have a bunch of shared spaces. So we have shared offices as well as uh, kitchenette areas. So we have like microwaves and fridges and sinks, which is really nice. And they're just like really cutting edge. I think you saw the picture that he was showing. Like it's just such a beautiful building and it's, it's also pretty gorgeous on the inside too. So uh, we have really, really amazing shared spaces. So when you're eating lunch, um, it's really easy to be able to talk to someone. Um, whereas on other places on campus, it can be a little um, isolating, although people are generally friendly. But I think just at Herrick, you kind of understand that you have the same research um, building. And so you kind of feel comfortable working with other people. And so um, I don't know if you guys have like had a, a taste of grad school yet, um, but it's also a little different from undergrad because people um, tend to hang out with people that they see every day. And so if you're like eating and lunch with people, it's also easier to say like, hey, let's go out to eat. Or um, at the end of the day, like, hey, do you have some time to go play Frisbee? Um, so I've, I've been organizing uh, Frisbee until COVID happened um, pretty weekly or monthly. And so a lot of people, I'll just like kind of reach out to them, um, see that they look like they want to maybe exercise. Um, so I think that that helps to be around people 
that um, could potentially hang out. Otherwise, um, like where, where do you meet people? It's, it's sort of difficult sometimes. So I really appreciate that space. Um, another thing I think is the amazing staff that we have. We have one of our staff members, I think on the call, but they just, they just work so hard to like plan events. And there's so much research that I've been able to do because of the staff at Herrick that I'm not really sure how it would have happened otherwise. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Um, like he said, I do some um, research in air, indoor air quality. And so it's pretty cool. I get to do that in the office that I work in. So not only do I sit there, but I get to study the place that I'm working in. So it's very practical. Um, and I think that's that's really neat to be on the edge of research like that. Like you have the best facilities and staff that can facilitate that kind of research. Uh, so I think it's a really great place to work. And I have like a really good social life because of it. And I really appreciate that. It's like people that are the kind of the same mindsets and just it's a really friendly community. Uh, so I hope you guys will consider um, when you're looking in general at grad schools, not only like your research, but your advisor as well, what they study, um, how novel the research can be, but as well as like the social aspect of it. Just keep that in the back of your mind, at least when COVID ends and you can be social. I think that's about all I have, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what you have to ask us, what, what's on your minds. Awesome. Well, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate that. And uh, that's really the formal presentation we have today on Eric. I wanted to leave lots of time for discussion. Uh, I'm sure many of you, like I am, I'm sick of being on Zoom meetings that are just monologues. So I thought it'd be more fun today if I thought we could try to answer your questions. Given that there's a compact number of us, you know, you're welcome to put it in chat or if you just want to come off of mute, uh, feel free to do so. And if you feel comfortable sharing your screen, that's always a bit more fun. Uh, when we can interact that way too. So uh, I think I'll, I'll pause there and be quiet and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. Hi, uh, Dr. Rhodes. Um, this is Akarimo. Could you speak to the uh, application process and how one goes about, let's say, finding a professor or project and working in a Herrick? Yeah, so that's a great question. So. Uh, you know, I'm a really strong believer, and this uh, often uh, upsets people in the administration, but I'm a really strong believer in finding an advisor rather than a school. Um, and so, you know, I always encourage students such as yourself that are looking at grad school opportunities to, you know, contact people you might be interested in working with, finding out what projects they have on their horizon. You know, it's less important what faculty are working on today, more important what they're working on tomorrow right, because they're likely hiring you for the next generation of projects and try to find a good fit there. And, you know, my way of thinking about it is a, a graduate student advisor relationship, and I'm sure Danielle can speak to this, is, is not simply like a working relationship. It's kind of like a life fit relationship, right, because this person's not only guiding your research or providing you advice, but honestly is there as a support mechanism, will be the person that writes letters of support for you for your first job, you know, all of those types of things. And so you want to have someone that, you know, you're kind of putting your career in their hands for a couple of years. Um, and so that relationship in my mind is like the most important part of grad school, even more than choosing which school you go to or something like that. So if that were me, I would start the process by really identifying places and people that are maybe doing things that are interesting to you and then certainly strike up conversations. Once you've got that list to a compact number, that's a good opportunity to submit your applications. I would encourage you in those applications to specifically name and, and articulate potential projects that you could work on with the people that you in, like and enjoy. And then really it's just a matter of sitting back and letting the process play out. So uh, in the case of Purdue, we tend to review applications fairly quickly. Uh, and so you tend to get word back pretty quick and uh, certainly then try to get on campus as soon as possible to start making the research happen. And uh, that application, is it like to produce graduate school or is Harry Park a separate entity by itself? No, it's, it's through the graduate school. We have a centralized application and review process. So uh, you would submit as conventionally done and that's kind of distributed out to the individual places. In the case of Herrick, uh, as Danielle alluded to, because we have students from a number of different schools, those applications are reviewed a few different places. Uh, but really the, the admittance, if you would, is, is tied largely to the faculty members that are here. And I think Dr. Rhodes, um, is this correct that most faculty who are at Herrick would have it on their website or like under their description somewhere? And 
like under the Herrick website, like you can see like all of the faculty. Absolutely. And uh, I see Marilee's on, or if not, I can post it or Brian can post it, but uh, we can post a link to our faculty page here. The only thing I would caution you, and I'm certainly guilty of this myself, is most faculty pages are a year by a day. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, probably good if you see something in the general area of what you want to do, reach out to that faculty member and see what they're doing currently. Uh, as I always tell my students, uh, the easiest way to find out if your research group's active is to see if the web page is up to date. If, it's, if it is, uh, they've probably had time to update it. If, it, if it's not up to date, uh, it's probably a sign that they're doing too much research. So, you know, don't take it as a bad sign if the page has been up for three years. Thank you very much. Hey, no problem. Other questions? Thank you, Brian, for posting that link for everybody. Don't be shy, we're happy to answer basically anything. I could go again. Yeah, please do. Oh, I think there's a question in the chat. I'll, I'll wait. Sure, Abdullah asked, is admitting a Herrick requires previous experience related to the project on Blindboard? Absolutely not, Abdullah. I think uh, you would find that uh, you know many students are kind of new to the uh, new to the process of grad school. We don't expect there to be a lot of in-depth understanding of, of the particular projects. It's normally a learning curve for everyone when starting a project, including faculty. Uh, so you know what fundamentally I think most of our faculty are looking for is a really strong fundamental skill set, uh, a willingness to learn, and and kind of a desire to have real world impact. Uh, and that last thing I think is often that passion that drives students uh, to success and that next level of impact, if you would. And so those are the things I certainly look for and I think is true for most of my colleagues as well. Other questions? Similar to what he just asked, I was just gonna ask, um, is it a disadvantage if say you don't have any previous research like undergrad research experience and also like what kind of requirements really stand out for you when you're looking at applications? You know, I always like to see some sort of experiential learning. It doesn't necessarily have to be undergraduate research. It could be an internship at a company or, or um, some other role like that, a co-op experience, maybe, maybe it's a study abroad. But uh, to be honest, I like to see some way that you've kind of challenged yourself in the real world, whatever that happens to be, uh, you know, kind of get out of the conventional classroom bounds. Uh, one of the things that I've found over the years, you know, I've been in academia now almost 20 years. Uh, one of the things that I find is that students that tend to push themselves and are comfortable making themselves uncomfortable, if that makes sense, are generally the best researchers. Uh, you know, if, if you kind of operate in a very narrow box all the time, it's hard to come up with creative ideas. You know, if you have a very narrow worldview, it's hard to be creative. You know, so to capitalize on that, um, kind of richness and diversity in every sense of the word, including kind of the ideation part of the words, um, I think you really wanna have some real world experience. And, and I think most faculty are kind of agnostic about which, which method that's going to be the first. And I'm guessing like Danielle, you probably did like one of those types of things as an undergrad, if not many, right? Is that a fair statement? Actually, no, but I did work after I graduated. There you go, right? So. Almost, I, I did once did a survey, and I think like if you looked at people that were co-op intern, did study abroad, or did undergraduate research, I think like the number last I looked in mechanical engineering overall was something like ninety percent of students that had one of those experiences. And I'm sure that's probably true in other areas as well. Other questions? We've got some good ones here. I'll warn you, if you don't have good questions, I just start karaoke, which is not good, so. Hey, Jeff, I can take a minute to talk about the conferences, if you like. Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Sure, so um, I think one of the great things about Herrick is that we do host one of the largest um, compressor refrigeration uh, buildings conferences in the world every other year. Um, we typically host about 800 people here on campus, which I think allows, um, a lot of our students to be able to interact and connect with companies all over the world. So think about that as you consider your grad school experience, um, you know, the ability to not only work on great research and projects, but the ability to um, network with people all over the world. 
Yeah, I think it's a really good point, Brian. Certainly we have events that bring people from all over the world here. And likewise, we, under normal circumstances, travel all over the world. So uh, definitely a lab with global out, uh, kind of global reach and global vision. I think, uh, I don't remember our current numbers now, but uh, approximately 50% of our graduate students are international students in Eric. Uh, and so certainly our, our impact is felt across the planet. I'm still waiting for the first uh, extraterrestrial uh, student at Herrick. Well, if there's no other questions, we can end the formal session. I'm happy to stick around here for a little bit of time. Those of you that might have interest, there's also a five o'clock session in this room on the Purdue Energex Research Center, which is a sister center to the Herrick Laboratories so that I'm also involved with, uh, where we'll be talking about some of our work in propellants, uh, solid rocket propellants, for example. Um, so certainly happy to do that, but uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes. And if you have any informal questions you want to ask after a few people move on, uh, feel free to reach out. And I'll put my email address here. And maybe I'll ask Danielle to do the same, um, that if you have any questions that you prefer to ask offline, uh, you can feel welcome to reach out to me or Danielle at our email addresses. And uh, we'd certainly be happy to answer those offline as well. And with that, have an awesome day. And uh, certainly love to see all of you here in the uh, the black and gold of Purdue University.